Welcome to the Standing in This Place podcast and today my special guest is Dr Stephen Walker. Welcome to the podcast Stephen. Thank you and uh, I'm very pleased to be here. So before we delve into uh, the cotton mills of Nottingham's Lean Valley, let's start off by, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your interests and your field of specialty? Yes, um, I'm, a, I'm a chartered geographer and um, I, I worked for many years, getting on for 40 years, in a local secondary school um, in the humanities faculty. Um, and when I retired, I took on a project or chose to take on a project um, looking at the cotton spinning mills in the Lean Valley close to where I live. Right. I'd been working with some volunteers um, in the uh, in the area. It's an area of woodland known as Moor Pond Woods. Um, and during the 18th century, it was the site of uh, ponds and channels that took water uh, to some cotton mills that were built in the 1770s. That's very new to me because before um, this conversation, I didn't know that Nottingham had got cotton mills as early as the 1780s. As, as each uh, area was uh, excavated, uh, my role was to map it and survey it. And it kind of hooked me, really, uh, to the extent that having started off as an occasional volunteer, I'm now the chairman of the group. Um, and, and effectively, I'm the project officer because I live virtually on the site anyway. So virtually everything that happens there goes through me. So in 2012, I got an accumulated amount of information um, about what was on site. But what we haven't really got a good picture of was the mills themselves. And do we know who owned these uh, cotton spinning mills? George Robinson, who built these mills with his family, his sons in particular, um, was had been working in the Lean Valley for a long time and knew Arkwright personally because Arkwright, um, when he patented his inventions, um, was living in Nottingham and working in Nottingham. Um, so, so he was a personal friend of Arkwright because they underwrote each other's wills and they were trustees for their children's wills. So, so there was there was more than just a passing acquaintance. Let's put it that way. Right. Well. We learnt about Arkwright and what he was doing in Nottingham in an earlier podcast with um, Adrian Farmer, who works with the Derwent Valley World Heritage Site. And it was interesting to hear about his early developments. So what happened next with Arkwright and Robinson? George Robinson paid Arkwright uh, for the use of his payment, and that wasn't always so. So um, later on, uh, Arkwright himself um, took several people to court because he said they'd infringed his patent. Uh, and George Robinson was actually used as a, a, uh, a, a witness to say, here's somebody who did what he was supposed to do. Oh, I see. We know that they were closely involved. We know that Robinson um, started work in 1778 uh, and built a purpose-built mill um, along the principles that Arkwright had designed. And um, it must have been fairly successful because um, within 15 years, the Robinson family had six big mills um, in the north end of the Lean Valley, stretching between Bulwell and Papplewick. That's a pretty big complex, six mills. And were they all cotton spinning mills? They were all cotton spinning mills, yes. Although, um, Robinson's core business was in dyeing and bleaching. Right. I, I have seen some old maps that show dye works along the Lean Valley. He'd worked in Nottingham since the 1830s, sorry, 1730s. So he was, he was an older man when he, when he started off um, on this cotton spinning business. And basically, I think they'd accumulated some capital and they saw a way of making more money. And therefore, they ploughed ploughed their capital into cotton spinning mills. Um, as far as we can tell, they were only spinning thread, uh, well, and doubling thread. Um, we don't know who they sold it to, but Nottingham would have been a ready market in those days because uh, framework knitting uh, was was a very important industry. Right. So, do we know much about George Robinson? We know very little about the firm of George Robinson and Sons, and we know 
even less about the people who worked for them. And what intrigued me as uh, as a historical geographer, really, um, was the way the way in which these mills impacted in the landscape, uh, because Papelwick is a rural area and was even more rural in in the 18th century. It's rural now. Uh, we're eight miles from the middle of Nottingham. Uh, we're surrounded by fields and trees. The present population of Papelwick Parish is only um, about 650. Uh, so Limby next door, um, which, which is a kind of matching parish really, they're either side of the Lee. Um, Limby's only got a present population of about 500. So even now, there are only 1,100 people living here, and yet he needed to find the workers to, to man these mills. So we've got six very large mills and a very small population. Uh, in the local area. So where did the workers come from? There are no records for Robinson and Sons as a business. These were very successful in their day. Uh, by 1820, the 1820s, they weren't particularly successful. The Robinsons sold the business in 1820. Um, it was split up into different, different groups of mills. Um, and the, the biggest group founded in, uh, in 1828. The mills were closed and the workers were dispersed. So how did you go about researching and finding out information about these workers? What I did was spend a lot of time in archives trying to find out more about the business, if you like, from reflected facts. So look, looking for things that related to them but weren't directly about them. Um, one of the things which I discovered was that there's a full set of insurance records in the London Metropolitan Archives, which effectively describe the mills. They give us an insurance value for them. They tell, tell us how many floors there are. Uh, they tell us what machinery was insured uh, and so on. So that gives us an idea of size. And um, I was very fortunate to come across in the Nottinghamshire Archive uh, a document that was written about 1790 uh, by somebody who later on became a partner in the Plesley Mills, uh, a gentleman by the name of Persh. Um, and effectively what he was doing was a kind of time and motion study and it's fortunate that it's been it's been uh, preserved um, there are four pages of full scap handwriting in the archives in nottingham that relate to robinson's mills and how they operated and he he gives a very big description of one of the mills uh, and we can work out from the description which one it is it's the one which was located at um the mill ponds in Bestwood, where, where Mill Lakes Country Park is now. Um, and we, we get to know quite a bit about it. From the insurance records, we know that it was a mill which was 130 feet long and that it was on six floors. Um, and we know that on the six floors, from Persh's description, we know what was carried out on the six floors, and he was particularly interested in the profitability. So we actually know how much it cost to um, maintain it, how much they paid the workers, and we know how many people worked there. And from that, we can scale up and work out how many people Robinson might have employed altogether. Uh, we know that at that one, one site, there were uh, 110 people with hands-on a hands-on job directly relating to cotton spinning um, ranging from uh, boys and girls who worked the machinery to the people who supervised them to the adults who worked in the reeling rooms and the accountant and the, and the store people so it, it lists all these roles uh, and tells us a bit about how much they were paid and it, Actually, it tells us how much money was being made by the mill because it, it's a kind of cost accounting that um, it costs this much in uh, cotton uh, raw material. It costs this much to actually produce the cotton and we're making this much money from selling it. Wow, those documents really paint a very clear picture of how big and industrious these mills were. And were these mills quite profitable? And we can work out that that in one year, this would have made £30,000. Wow. Now, £30,000 in 1790 was a substantial amount of money. 
Mm. And so it was obviously a very profitable business. And if Robinson had six of these mills and there were a hundred people employed in this one, certainly four of the mills were a similar size to this. So we might be talking about five or 600 people working with hands-on cotton experience. So if you wasn't working directly with the raw cotton and spinning, uh, were there other kind of roles uh, within these mills? Um, when you bought into Arkwright's patent, you didn't get an IKEA flat pack set of machinery. You got a set of plans that you were expected to make. So they employed blacksmiths, they employed carpenters. They, they had a warehouse in the middle of Nottingham. Most of their material must have come up the Trent because it's the only cost effective way of transporting bales of cotton that weighed between half and a tonne. Um, so to carry something like that, they would have relied on canal transport. The Trent is the most is the cheapest uh, and most effective means of transport. And they certainly had built a, a canal side um, warehouse when the canal was opened in the 1790s. So we know a bit about that. So therefore, they were trans transporting these bales from the middle of Nottingham to Papplewick. So they needed um, they needed people to, to cart, they needed to, to grow food for horses, they needed blacksmiths and people to look after the, their haulage business, if you like, and the logistics side of the business. So I would estimate that at its peak, this firm must have employed between 1,000 and 1,500 people. I see. Well, I actually found that in my own family history where... Uh, the father, who was a blacksmith, uh, and his four children who went in the cotton mill, the father, I think, must have been using his blacksmithing skills on the machinery. Do we know much about where these people were coming from? Um, in 1750, the total population of Papawick and Limby was 250 people. So they must have imported workers, and that intrigued me. Um, so, so I was I was interested to, to having found out a bit about the basics of the business and some of the costing. Uh, my my next task really was to try and find out something about the people, if we could. Um, and so I started what turned into quite a long project, um, trying to name people. So often, when we're talking about the industrial revolution, we think of workers as a mass. And I wanted to think of them as individuals. So I wanted to be able to, if possible, to name people and to use records such as they were to try and chart their progress. Where were they born? When did they come here? How long did they stay? Where did they go when the mills closed? Was my basis. Um, and, and to try and put any other information which would make real people out of these kind of faceless workers. Right. My start was actually with the apprentices. Um, we know from other records that Robinson brought apprentice children from the workhouse at Marylebone in the middle of London. Ah, this is something I've heard before about uh, children being taken from London to come and bolster the workforce across the Midlands. Briefly, the Marylebone Workhouse, Marylebone Workhouse was, was fairly close to the Houses of Parliament. Um, so it was right in the middle of London. And um, Marylebone is the next parish out from the city of London. And um, they had over 3,000 people living in their workhouse. Uh, the 1790s were a time of great poverty in central London, partly because the death rate had been falling, so more people were surviving, partly because we were now into the French wars and lots of the men were serving in the military and um, London being a port had a fair number of mariners as well. So they were serving in the Navy, they were serving in the army. There were a large number of single parent families living in London because the men were away or even worse, because the men had been killed or maimed in some way. So actually there was a huge problem in the middle of London looking after destitute people. 
Uh, and in order to pay for it, they had a straight choice, really. They either taxed the local ratepayers, um, which obviously taxes then were unpopular and, the, and they're unpopular now. So they either charged the local ratepayers to make the money to keep all these people, or they had to find some way of making money. And the way that they chose to make money was the early workhouses uh, were um, known as houses of industry. And what they did was that they put these people to work. I see. Um, now, I know that the later Victorian workhouses um, were on a very different principle. These Georgian workhouses um, were, they were a little less inhumane. Um, for example, people were allowed to mix. They weren't segregated, men and women. Um, and um, they weren't given menial tasks to do just to take their time up and make life unpleasant as they were in Victorian workhouses. Um, what they did was that they put them to work, either that they, um, they took a trade, something that they already did, or in fact that they taught them a trade. Now with the children, of course, um, anybody who had no parents uh, or who had been abandoned by their parents um, was therefore a ward of the workhouse. So legally, the workhouse was the legal guardian of these children. And as such, they needed to make sure that they were educated to, to join the workforce. Uh, and the workforce, of course, started at the age of 12 in the 1780s. So schooling was virtually non-existent. Ah, yes. The ch my child ancestors were between 11 and 15 who worked in the cotton mills. And so if a child had been living at home, its parents would have been finding it things to do around the house from the age of five and six onwards. And by the time the child was about 12, it would have been found meaningful employment. And by the time a child was about 14, it would have found been found an apprenticeship. In other words, it was going to be taught a trade which by the time the child aged the, reached the age of majority, that's the age of 21, um, the child would be able to look after itself and have a trade that it could earn money with. Mm. So what the workhouses were trying to do was to find apprenticeships for the children who were um, their responsibility. Unfortunately, there were more children than there were opportunities. And so they they came up with a scheme that the children were sent to um, other places in batches. So they were never sent on their own. It must have been quite a, a journey for those small children leaving, you know, the bustling city of London and then arriving in some of the rural areas of Nottinghamshire. Uh, there were some very strict rules about how this was going to, to be undertaken. Um, it was a two-way binding agreement. So the Robinsons were kind of paid to take these children. They were paid a bursary per child. Uh, and in return for that, the workhouse checked up on the children. Um, the Robinsons had to tell them where the children were and what they were doing. And if they left their employment, they had to, they had to let the workhouse know. Yeah. So there was a paper trail. Um, every child who left the workhouse needed the signatures of two justices of the peace um, to underwrite the deal, so to speak. So it's not um, like Oliver Twist. When Dickens was writing about Oliver Twist, this is the Victorian workhouse of the new poor law. And what we're talking about here is the old poor law, uh, the Georgian poor law. I see. And do we know what these boys were doing? From 1790, uh, the Robinsons had a workforce which was in part these apprentice boys. And we know a bit about them. We know how old they were when they left Marylebone. Um, some of them unfortunately died while they were here. Um, and there is a local legend, uh, which I was keen to, to examine, that these boys were buried at dead of night. They were maltreated, uh, virtually worked into the ground. Um, and and I wanted to try and explore that. It, it turns out that what the burial records in Papawick and Limby show, the clerk used a particular form of work, words for these people. Um, he, he always referred to them as 
a London boy at Mr. Robinson's Mills. So if you look through the burial records of Limby and, and Pepplewick, from 1790 until about 1810, there are 44 burials which have that specific form of words. Uh, a, a London boy at Mr. Robinson's Mills. Now, people had always assumed that these were small children. Um, and the, in fact, when you look into it, that's not true. Because once we know the names of these boys, we know when they left Marylebone, and we know how old they were when they left Marylebone. So we now know how old they were when they were buried. Right. Um, and, and in fact, the early ones were of 20 odd year olds. Um, so so the, uh, the, first boy, the first London boy, in inverted commas now, to be buried in, uh, in Limby and Pepplewick was in, uh, I think, 1793. And it, it was a, an adult of 23. Now, what's happened, of course, is that presumably these kids had a fairly strong southern accent and they were always referred to as London boys. Um, even in the 1860s, there's a burial in the Limby Register um, where the clerk has called him a London boy. This is somebody who had lived in Limby on and off for 40 or 50 years, and he's still referred to as a boy. It was an older man. <laughs> so, <coughs> so I think um, the, the legend has got the wrong end of the stick. The legend is... Um, is that somebody has looked at these registers and decided that these were children and they're not mm. some of them are but most of them are older yeah so having got some named people i then started at the other end and thought right well if we know when they were born and if we know um how old they are and when they came to Papawick, did any of them stay? Well, yes, they did, because they start turning up in marriage registers. And through that, um, they start turning up fairly soon after in baptism registers. And hopefully without the term London boy as the father. So I was able to um, write my thesis, uh, which eventually was, uh, was published through the university and is available from the university if people are interested. It, there's a section about the cotton spinning industry locally. Uh, there's a section about the physical um, operation of the mills, where the water came from, um, how big the mills were, that sort of thing. And there's also a social history section that talks about uh, the workforce and the migration of the people, where they came from, where they went. Um, it's interesting to hear that that Nottingham and the Lean Valley had a mill complex, you know, equally as large as the Derwent Valley. And that's something I, I wasn't aware of. Like, like in the Derwent Valley, uh, time came where in order to attract people to the mills, they needed to provide housing. So there were colonies around the mills of cottages. Um, Robinson um, built their first houses in 1780, um, which is contemporaneous with the first building at Cromford. Um, so, so these are contemporaneous. Uh, and actually some of them have survived so we know what the houses are like but they are some of the later ones um i was very fortunate that um what one of the other loose ends i should have said was that we know virtually nothing about the actual operation of robinson's mills and as i've said what we're looking at is circumstantial evidence effectively you've painted uh, you've painted such an amazing picture by using uh, various different ways to go into the archives and look at a different set of records to try and paint that picture of that of that mill complex and you know what i'm finding amazing is is the sheer size of all of these mills in such a small rural area that i know very well today uh, having been taken to papawick pumping station rather a lot as a child to marvel at the piston engines <laughs> now there's an interesting story there's an interesting story of that as well you see because uh Papawick pumping station was the last engine that bolton and watt as a company made one of the first engines they made was for robinson's cotton mills really i, I didn't know that so the first the first steam engine anywhere in the world 
to provide rotary motion in a textile mill was in Pepplewick. Gosh. 1785. <laughs> so they were they were not only entrepreneurs, but they, they were also at the cutting edge of improving their business. Uh, and they were prepared to gamble on using steam power. So so that's a key difference then between when we look at the Derwent Valley, it's it's built along the, the River Derwent, yeah. which is a, a large river, and you're getting a lot of yes, water it's power. It's a substantial mill. source of water, yeah. yes. And in fact, most of the Derwent mills have not stored much water. There are mill ponds to hold up the river behind a weir, but if that essentially the Derwent mills all use water that's um, close to the river. Now, Robinson had a difficult problem. The River Lean um, today is much the same as it was then. It's about a cubic metre per second of flow down the River Lean, which is not a lot of water. Um, I, I don't know what the cubic metre per second is of the Derwent, but it'll be a lot more than that. Um, if you think of the width of the Derwent, um, compared to the lean. The lean is about a metre and a half wide uh, in Papelwick, uh, and the Derwent at, uh, at Cromford is considerably wider than that. <laughs> um, so, so the Robinsons always had a problem with lack of water, and they solved that problem, or tried to solve that problem in two ways. Uh, one was in storing water above ground. They built a reservoir system network uh, that allowed them to store water when the river level was low. Uh, but they also experimented with steam engines, and they had two. Uh, by 1790, they had two working steam engines. So that's a real clear difference between the Nottinghamshire cotton mills and the Derbyshire cotton mills, um, that source of power using water in different ways. So is there any other differences? Like, uh, do we know where the raw cotton was coming from as it made its way into Nottingham and onto the Lean Valley and Robinson's Mills? Um, there were two companies that were importing cotton in the time which I'm interested in, let's say the 1790s. Um, one was Sandeman's, and most people who um, enjoy a tip of sherry will know the name Sandemans. Um, from the 18th century, Sandemans were importing sherry from Portugal. Um, and as part of the cargo, they filled the ships with cotton from Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony. Uh, and they brought it to the port of London and sold it on. Um, within the Sanderman records, there are some records of um, about, about a dozen sales to Robinsons um, of cotton that was coming from, from Brazil via Lisbon through London and then being sent to Nottingham. Um, and the Robinsons said that they wanted their cotton to be delivered to Hull. Right. So we know that this cotton was dumped on the quayside in Hull and made its way from Hull to Gainsborough uh, because um, the, uh, the Trent and the Humber uh, ocean going ships can only get to Hull. Um, you need some sort of lighter, which is a smaller ship effectively, to take it from Hull to Gainsborough. And then from Gainsborough, it would be transshipped to barges to use the Trent navigation. Um, which would have brought it to Nottingham. Uh, from the 1790s, um, the Nottingham Canal was created and the uh, what's, what's now the Beeston Link, which goes from Beeston to the middle of Nottingham and back out to the Trent. Um, that was built in the 1790s um, and that's where the Robinsons had their warehouse, close to where the BBC building is now on London Road. The, the picture that you've painted has just been amazing to sort of uh, reimagine that lean valley of Nottingham with all of these huge mill buildings uh, and that all of that cotton coming from across the globe, coming into Nottingham, being spun and then feeding the framework knitting industry and the, the lace making industry that Nottingham's known for. And that's a story I wasn't aware of when um, when I've been looking at this uh, story of cotton and this this journey uh, of the working classes, so I want to thank you for helping to paint that wonderful picture. And um, I'd like to ask if you'd be happy to come back for another episode, Stephen. 
I think I'm going to need to because we haven't actually mentioned Dali Abbey yet, have we? So, <laughs> so it looks like I've talked myself into a return match, but I'll be delighted um, because I, I think it's an important story that, as you say, has not much been told. Thank you so much for being a wonderful guest. Thank you very much and goodbye to you. Well, I do hope you've enjoyed listening to this series of the Standing in This Place podcast supported by National Lottery Project Grants through Arts Council England. We're going to take a, a short break over the Christmas period and we'll be back in the new year to continue with this story of the global cotton connection. <laughs>